Hello and welcome to another week of our encounter study. We're glad to be back with you. Looking forward uh, here very soon. You should be getting your spring encounters. Um, so um, hang in there. We're a little late. We had some publishing issues, but we're over them and they should be there. Um, also, remember, you can get the encounter on a Kindle edition. You can just go to Amazon and type in spring encounter study and that'll come up and you'll see the logo there and you'll be able to download it. We've had fun doing that. Um, that has reached now to the United Kingdom. We have sold nice. some in the United Kingdom, so that's kind of fun. Also wanted to take a chance um, as uh, Reverend Becky has started her new position. She is also helping uh, with the young adult ministry. Uh, Becky and myself will be doing a young adult cohort that Nathan Wheeler has put together four different ones. So if you go to your website and type in cpcmc.org forward slash YA cohorts, as in young adult cohorts, YA cohorts, uh, you will go to this page right here. Let me see if I do this. Right. Hopefully I have. And so anyway, CP, yeah, cpcmc.org, YA cohorts. Uh, Becky and myself will be doing this one called A Life-Giving Way, Holy Habits for Developing Spirituality in an Unspiritual World. And that's going to consist of exploring the different historical practices that the church has taught for thousands of years that sometimes we've let go. They're going to be, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, the disciplines of what we call abstinence, those things that you give up, but then also uh, the disciplines that you take on, you know, like, um, you know, the prayer, the service, those types of things. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to do. It's a uh, $75, at least our cohort is 75 bucks. You can see the different ones that they're doing. But ours is going to be $75, and that will include July 9th through the 13th, we'll be retreating to uh, the Tukalahichi Retreat Center near the Smoky Mountains, and uh, we'll have classes in um, April and May, or May and June, and then in July, we'll kind of finish up with this retreat in which we'll kind of tie everything together. So be sure, if you know somebody in the young adult category that might be looking for um you know, something, something new, something different, something to help solidify their faith before they go off to college or while they're in college or transitioning in that young adult stage that they're in. Uh, we will love to have you. Becky, got anything else on that? I'm just really excited about the opportunity to share some spiritual disciplines with some young people. Um, it's so important that we establish those habits early on. Um, cause as you get more of the world involved in your life, it's harder to reestablish those habits. And it's a good reminder for all of us that we need a spiritual daily discipline. We do. And, and in such a way that it, so the, the biggest goal that we're going to work on is, is that we just don't see these things as add-ons. Like you have 24 yeah. hours in a day. You can't just keep adding activities because you can't add hours, right? So, so how do you incorporate the Christian faith in the rhythms of life? If you want to get kind of Celtic about it, just we incorporate our faith in our daily life to where daily it becomes a practice of the presence of God. Is That's really right. Real, is the whole. Every day, every day. So now lesson 10, this is for February mm -hmm. 6th. We're still in John four, a little later in the chapter, we've entitled this lesson healing for all people. The devotional reading comes from revelation seven, nine through 17. Our prayer for illumination today Healing God, we are in need of healing, not only in our bodies, but in our minds and hearts as well. As we study your word today, heal our bad ways of thinking and acting. Send the Holy Spirit and melt away our hard hearts so that this lesson is applied to our hearts and we respond in faithfulness. Amen. And then the Amen. scripture selection is John 4, 46 through 54, with the memory verse being John 40, 50. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started on his way. So there sets us up. Let me just go ahead and ask this uh, introduction reflection question. Have you faced a situation where your faith has been challenged? How did you handle it? How has your faith ever wavered during tough times? What keeps you tethered to your faith? So Becky, I'll open that up to you. Mm -hmm. You can answer all of them or you can just pick up something there that you just strike oh, and boy. go on. Do we have enough time to do the whole story? Because, wow. Go ahead. No, okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to keep my long story short. So it, gosh, how has my faith been challenged? Um, 
the way I grew up and understanding scripture to where I am today challenged me drastically. And there was a 10 year period when I left the, the group that I was formerly with before I joined the Cumberland Presbyterian church. Um, I had 10 years in between where I was unchurched and through that, my faith was challenged all the time because it was, if you really believed in God, then da, 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 da. Um, if you really thought that God existed, then da, 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 da. And I really struggled during that 10 years of whether or not I always felt like there was something there, but I just didn't understand exactly what that was. Um, and really faced a lot of worldly challenges through that. And finally coming back and settling on. Yeah, absolutely. God is there. And Jesus came and died for my sins so that I can have life and life abundantly. And what a beautiful thing that is. So has it wavered? Sure. Um, it has wavered, especially during that time. Um, but what keeps me tethered now is being able to look back on all of that and recognize God working through all, even my questioning, even my struggles, even when people challenged me as to whether or not something was really there, I can see now how God worked through all of that. And that's what keeps me tethered because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is real and um, that God works in my life all the time. Very good. Um, so long story, made it short. <laughs> yeah. There's a scene in the movie Clue which I love, one of my favorite movies. And uh, okay, you ever seen it? I didn't know that. Oh. I have seen that movie. So there's a scene in there to where he's like, to make a short story very long, and then he continues. And that's always been my preacher quote. But um, I think for me, um, so like I have, we've explained before, I've said this, I've had, I had some kind of experience that I can't explain. And so that's always tethered me. But so far as like, has my faith ever wavered? Yes, but not in the sense of whether I believed or didn't believe that Jesus and God were real and all that jazz. There came a time in my life, it was, like when my brother passed away, that, that didn't shake my faith much. Or, you know, when people close to me, it didn't shake my faith. It probably strengthened my faith in a lot of ways. The thing that I wavered on is there was a point in time in my life where like I felt like I was giving, 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 giving. And I wasn't, I wasn't, maybe it was because of my attitude, but I wasn't, um, uh, when I say I was giving, my house was always open to somebody. I never had a moment of peace, like either some kid was going to school, college, couldn't afford something, parents weren't helping them, so they went, or um, one time I convinced somebody to come help me with the youth group at the Margaret Hank Church because we didn't have the money, and they lived in my house for a while, and and like I would give money away and all that jazz, and, and it just felt stuck, and I was like, man, it just seems like if I'm doing these good things, something should happen good. And, sure. and so I got to a point and maybe it was burnout to where I didn't, it didn't shake my faith in again, God or whether Jesus was, but did they really care or were the promises really true? So I did go through that a little bit. Mm, um, yeah. And then of course, as you now, I see all of those things were necessary to be where I am today. And I couldn't be any happier with my job or my position or any, you know, my wife and family and all that jazz. Um, so I can't complain, but it, there was a shaky parts there. There's sure. Um, and I think if we're honest with ourselves and we all have those shaky moments, even though people that look like they have it all together. And, and I think that's really important that we recognize that even within our own study group, you know, if you're, if you're teaching this and you're talking about this today, because a lot of times people that come to Sunday school, we think, they have their whole life together and everything's just hunky dory and fine. And it's, and it's through these conversations that we realize the humanity of each other, recognizing that we all have our struggles and have our moments of wavering and just trying to understand what that means and how to work through that. Yeah. Yeah. It's easier. The grass is always greener. You can always compare yourself to the greatness of somebody until you get to know them and you're like, wow, well, that was misplaced. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so true. I think the reason uh, Kip asked this is because of the scripture selection that we're in. We get to, a, you know, one of the royal officials, uh, probably a, a official at the uh, synagogue in Capernaum, um, comes to Jesus because his son's dying. And so, like, what can challenge your faith probably more than, than something like that happening? I mean, it can shake you. I mean, like, what do you do? Like, when you find out you have no control over the things you love the most. Um, 
So that's what that was. And then, so when the introduction Kip goes in and he talks about the, you know, the community of faith is, is important sometimes because God's not going to grant all your requests. You know, he's not the genie in the bottle that guarantees three wishes. Um, that's not, that's not who God is, it's not how God operates. And so we have this uh, faith community, like, you know, when I was down or when I was shaken, I remember there was one particular elder that um, I could go to for spirit. I mean, she was a, you know, very mature, older lady, but mature in the faith. And I, and I, I trusted her and I was able to, you know, she had gone through life. And, and so anyway, that's what Kit brings up um, mm -hmm. in this introduction is that we, we have this community and he'll bring it up more later as the lesson goes on. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, and so at the bottom of that introduction, the bottom paragraph, he said, but what if you have no faith to begin with? What if the last place you can turn is to someone you've heard about but don't actually know? And that's what happening. That's what's happening with this royal official in today's reading. He has no childhood faith that gives him hope and trust in Jesus or whatnot. So, mm -hmm. so that's. But he ends that paragraph with this official's life will soon change and he will learn what it truly means to believe in Jesus Christ. And I loved that because I thought, isn't that the same for each of us? I think so. As, and it should be. I mean, that, that is, that is the key. When we meet Jesus, wherever we are in life, when we truly meet Jesus, our life changes and in amazing and astonishing ways, ways that we don't understand ways we cannot comprehend, but we change because we've had this beautiful experience with the savior. Yeah. I'm cynical always in life, um, because sure. of real, whatever you want to call it, but like, I mean, what I see in this and what I sometimes feel in my own life, and especially during that time that I talked about, when the disciples in John 6 talk about when Jesus says, you know, eat my flesh, drink my blood, and then everybody leaves and Jesus says, what do you want to leave to? And, and pretty much like it's translated a little different and maybe they say it different, but when he says, do y'all want to leave too? You can almost read into that. Yeah, but where else can we go? Like, right. In some sense, it's a resignation saying, well, if you're not it, then I don't know where else to go. So I'm going to put my trust and my faith and my hope in you because this is the closest I've ever come at least. And then of course they grow through that. But that's how I feel. Sometimes people come to Christ. A lot of times it's like, especially in this world today where, where you've gotten away from religious thinking or even thinking that the church is valuable or faith is valuable. And then sometimes you get to a point in life to where, Oh, Anne Lamont, was it last week? We talked about her conversion last week. Or two week, weeks ago. Week yeah. Before. Yeah. Whatever I was thinking was. about that story. But you just get to the point you're like, well, nothing else works. So let's let's at least give this so an honest try. Sure. Sure. Or uh, it might have been two weeks ago, or it might have been even three weeks ago. Kip used that story about Bob, about yeah, how he came to the faith right. through um through having a health crisis and and okay. just you know terrified, terrified that he was gonna die and, and go to hell. And that's how he came to the faith, but it was through that action and then being involved more in church activities that he really understood who Jesus was in his life. So anyway, I pray that everybody's listening to this wouldn't have, to, it's like, you know, the drunk, you know, the addict, you don't yeah. have to hit rock bottom. Maybe you can recognize your need before you hit rock bottom, but a lot of times sure. you got to hit rock bottom, find the trap door, go further down and then go on your way back up, you know? Right. So, right. But anyway, I think that's yeah. a good setup for, for what we got today. I agree. So the exploring the scripture historical setting, um, we're getting back to Cana. Cana is where Jesus first, like Kip brought, brings up the first sign, the first miracle is Cana. Mm -hmm. So maybe he, maybe he digs Cana because he's found some, you know, people who don't want to constantly kill him or give him trouble. It's always right. nice to find that the, place. It is, it is nice. It is nice to have that place in life. Yeah. <laughs> He's ventured into Samaria. He had a pretty successful ministry in that sense. Like, right, like a lot of the Samaritans um, came and, and learned more about him. The Samaritan woman mm -hmm. preached and proclaimed in her way of, of the Messiah. Uh, and so now he comes back here. And Kip asked, why were the Galileans so excited to see him? And I think, you know, obviously they had seen, they had, he came in and did a wonderful thing at a wedding. So let's see how this young man's doing. Um, and so then it sets up. Um, the, it, then that sets up the narrative of what we get with the Royal official. So, um, 
anything you want to jump in before we keep rolling? We'll say that this is the second sign of John that points yeah. to Jesus Christ as, as God's yeah. Messiah. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting, I think there's a, an interesting flow that we're going to, we're going to talk about that Nicodemus came to Christ by night out of curiosity, yeah. more than likely just trying to understand who, who exactly he was and what, it, what he was teaching. Um, and he came to him by night, but then the next story we have is the Samaritan woman who he met in broad daylight, um, at a well. And, and again, like you said, he had a successful ministry there in Samaria and a lot of people came to believe in who he was. And now he's back where he began with the, with the wedding story. Now he's back, but now we have a Royal official who like Nicodemus has a lot of prestige, well-known in the community, um, has a lot of power and clout but is now coming to Christ in broad daylight. In and part of that in desperation, you know, Nicodemus came out of curiosity, but here you have this Royal official who has exhausted all of his other possibilities um, and is now coming to Jesus out of just complete desperation for help and assistance for his child. And that's an interesting, again, we keep talking about John has this really, neat flow to his story the way he has set up and structured everything and and the different signs that he has put in they're all for pointing to the deity of who christ is and so don't miss that there's this flow that's also going with these different people that jesus is meeting and how we went from uh, a high official nicodemus coming at night and then a very lowly person you know a woman of samaria broad daylight but now we have the high official broad daylight yeah and and i think it also shows um john is commenting on the fact we all come at different times and for different reasons yes because we're forced to jesus maybe out of curiosity and maybe we come mm -hmm. at night because we're a little embarrassed and then the samaritan in shock unexpected that she, that she unexpected like right yeah. why would this jew care about me but he does right and then you have this royal official who, if he is a official of the synagogue in Capernaum, probably had those same maybe embarrassments that Nicodemus had, but he's got a dying kid. And so like. Desperate. Yeah. Excuses be darned. Who cares? I don't care if my little friends won't like me. My kid's dying and this guy heals people and I'm going to mm -hmm. do my very best. This is my last shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of times I can, I mean, like you probably had church members and you could look out on your congregation. And those stories are probably represented in every pew. Sure. Um, sure. And so I think, so John is at one time affirming, but then also displaying, you know, how Christ is the Messiah. That is the source of life for every situation that you're looking for. Yes. Yes. And meets people right where they are, no matter what agenda it is that they're coming to him with. Yeah. Um, so the very uh, bottom, the, last paragraph on page 67 um i i think it would just be good that as we go through these things we pick up on these signs and what these signs mean so mm -hmm. skip right so when jesus turns water into an abundance of wine he reveals the abundance of god within him i think yes but then also that we have an abundant life inside of us when we sure. are in christ that and that christ is the source of that what is earlier described i like i like the phrase in john grace upon grace mm -hmm good but anyway when he heals the royal official son without even being in proximity of him it is now seen that jesus's words can be believed that jesus's words mean life and that jesus's words sustain promise sustain and promise relationship and that's from carolyn lewis but i think you know that's i think signs mean different things i think there's a certain obviously a sign points to something but it also you can feel that imagery in many ways and i think that's mm -hmm. one way to do it and I think the other way to do it is this is also a sign that Jesus is Lord of life and yeah. he's Lord period. Period. Um, End of story. Right. So there's, there's a way, but I'm sure in a Sunday school class, I think you could open that up, get you a list of the different miracles that serve as signs. Maybe y'all can have a discussion about what, what each sign means. What, what does it highlight? And, you know, why is it important? Why would John 
arrange them in this order, uh, these kinds of things. I think that would yep. be a good, good thing to do. Uh, anything else on that exploring the scripture section? I don't think so. I think that was pretty good. Of course it's good. It is good. Silly. Um, uh, all right. So let's go to digging deeper. Um, and in this, Kip brings up different stories of healing yeah. with Jesus. Some that are directly in the book of John, some that he just brings up that are uh, outside of the book of John. And I think what he's trying to do there. It, okay, so then what, what Kip does is he brings out these uh, different healings in which Jesus seems to hesitate or to play a little bit before he does the actual healing. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and a lot of times it is, it is those moments where there's a difference in the Jews and the, and the non-Jews or those considered privileged or not privileged. And so there's something in the sense that like here in this story, um, it said, when the official heard in verse 47 of our text, when he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So, right, so you have the sense in which this royal official is on his knees begging, um, and then Jesus says, all you want to see is signs. Mm -hmm. But then Jesus goes ahead and heals the person, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's sure. a couple different times where Jesus does that in the gospel. Um, yeah. And, I, and so the question, I guess, I, I guess maybe we'll, we'll do this with the discussion question. Looking at these stories, who, see, who seemed to humble themselves the most? Why do you think Jesus hesitated in granting their request? Does Jesus oh. show partiality? And so one of them, of course, you might remember, um, you know, the woman that's underneath the table or kneeling by yeah. jesus and jesus says you know i i can't give food to the dogs and then she says well even dogs get the crumbs right so that's right. one of them and then there's there's like the the woman even the woman who was bleeding right in some sense he questioned her she was healed but you know so there's a lot of these stories in which jesus for some reason wants to yeah comment he, so what do you think off. yeah i don't know that's that's a great um that's a great question I mean, there was, there was the idea that maybe it is because that they're a Gentile um, and, and not a Jew. I know, I know maybe he's questioning the sincerity, you know, is it just because, and I think we get more into that and in learning from the scripture, um, but is it just because you've heard that I'm a healing person that you're coming to me or do you have, is it the sincerity that you understand and believe in who I am? And maybe that's more of what the hesitation is, you know, because that's, that's kind of what Jesus implies, even with this Royal official here in John chapter four is all you want is a sign. Yeah. It's not because you believe it's just because you want want me to do something for you you just want something to happen and of course he was coming out of desperation i mean he was begging right. you know his child was dying and i can't imagine that anybody any parent not beg for the life of their child you know when you see your child sick and just hurting i just i can't imagine knowing that this is your last opportunity um, you've heard about Jesus's healing and this Royal official has come to him and is on his knees, just begging out of pure desperation, please, please heal my child. He's probably exhausted all the other resources that he has available to him. And here he is just bowing down in front of him asking and Jesus saying, all you want, you know, all you want is all you want is a sign, seems but hard. then it, that seems harsh. But at the same time in that scripture, the memory verse for today, verse 50, the man believed. Yeah. And I think that's the key. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke and started on his way. Yeah. I like that, so, that belief is that, is that I think that key element. I think it is. There is a sense in humility too. I mean, like, I don't think you can come to Christ unless it's on your knees begging in some sense. I agree. Brings up second paragraph from the bottom on 68. You've been a pastor. 
you you had a manse there in you know behind the church or in front of the church or wherever it was where he says churches often get a knock at the door for help and most churches are hesitant because the person asking for help has no relationship to the church and that person's sincerity is constantly questioned well yeah like right sure like and i get that like i hate it i'm i'm still here in the manse at at the church and i do occasionally get knocks on the door for Mm -hmm. people asking for assistance and and it's always really difficult because you do question, you know, these are people that have no affiliation with the church whatsoever. They just pick the house because they know probably the pastor lives here and, and they're asking for help, you know, and how, how do you handle that? That's, that's always, that's the tough one, yeah. you know. Yeah. I also think too, there's this sense in which I don't think Christ was being just evil to them at all. No, no, I don't think so either. But I do think their faith is great in some, maybe it's, I don't know, because like uh, the very last paragraph on 68, last sentence there, um, where it said each admitted they had nowhere else to turn. So number one, it was desperation, right? It sure. isn't about Jesus necessarily. That Like the this healer or this this royal official didn't come to Jesus because he like really knew Jesus. It was right. because his son was dying. Like, yes. You know, um, so total anyway, desperation yeah they had nowhere else to turn and jesus listened as others spoke for them like the centurion or took on being less than even the dogs like the woman or believing mm-hmm. even before his son is healed persistence and humility leading to trust and faith in jesus christ so i think there's a mm-hmm. sense in which um you know they came because of one thing but jesus maybe needed to establish that yeah but i'm the real thing that you need yeah and then go ahead and and, and make that bridge a little bit maybe right. I, I can't right. speak for God or that situation but I I don't think Jesus is necessarily going to be honoring for the purpose of being honored no I don't I don't think that was that at all I, I think there was a purpose in in saying what he said maybe to make them pause and think about what their intention truly is even though they're coming to them out of desperation but why is it just because you want to see a sign or a miracle or is it because you recognize maybe you need something more? Yeah. Yeah. Anything else on that one? Mm -mm. That was good. All right. So we're going to start, I think what I want to do for the learning from the scripture, witness of the church section, I'll start with the reflection question. But what Kip does here is he brings those other stories back into, um, and so like the stories that he started talking about, like in Mark with the paralytic, like nobody, the paralytic couldn't walk to Jesus. Right. But the paralytic had people bring him to Jesus or like when uh, the centurion is the centurion son where like um, they bring him to Jesus and say, look, he's done a lot of good things for the Jews. Right. So they're, they're, yes. they're pleading for these people that are on outside, behalf of, yes, on behalf of. And so, that's what he, that's what Kip picks up on in this learning from the scripture section. So I'm just going to read this. Who are the people who have helped you through life's difficulties? What are the things that have helped you through the most? Or what are the things that have helped you through the most? Yeah, I guess. Have you ever gone through this, dif- any difficulty alone? If so, how did you do it? Can you count on, can you count on your church in times of crisis? So I'll just let you. Mm, mm. So really who have helped me through life's difficulties? Um, I would be a terrible child if I did not tell you my parents, yeah, Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you can't turn to your parents, man, that is so hard. And I know there are people out there that can't. And I hope that the church understands that there are those people in this world that have no, no one else, but the church to turn to for help. They don't have family that would help them. Um, but my parents have helped us through so many difficulties, so many things, um, just emotional and financial and mental and spiritual, how they have helped through through my life. So mom and dad, thank you. You've been amazing. Um, have ever gone through some difficulties alone? Sure. Um, I think as a pastor, sometimes you don't think that you can reach out for help, um, because you're supposed to be the spiritual lead to your your community 
And so I think sometimes there are things that you're going through that it, it is difficult to reach out for help. And so sometimes you do end up just kind of shouldering that difficulty alone, whatever it, it is. Um, I can think of one situation in particular, um, how did I do it? Lots of prayer, <laughs> lots of prayer and just seeking God, um, for wisdom and guidance and peace in the situation and um, trying to help me understand, you know, the why isn't always there. I think Kip talks about that even through this whole section that, um, there are faithful people and good people, but miracles don't always happen for them. Good things that's don't always cool. happen to good people, you know, and that's something that, that I think we need to talk about too. And, and even in the Sunday school class, that's a great conversation to have is sometimes bad things happen to good people. And, and we struggle with why, why is that? Um, could I count on my church in times of crisis? Absolutely. My church families are just uh, amazing people. I have watched them just really help people through really hard times. Like I can think of one specific, um, had a person lose their spouse and it was, uh, um, very traumatic, just very sudden, um, young person, younger person. Um, and I watched the, the church just gather around that person and, and lift them up during that hard time. So yeah, definitely can count on the church during that. So that's, what I hope you Kip, can too. Yeah. That's what Kip is bringing up. You know, there are times like, you know, in Jesus, when he walked through the crowd, there were all kinds of problems, but Sorry. I don't think he stopped and healed everybody. It wasn't like, you know, I, like in the Marvel yeah. movies where you could be like, Pacha, and then everything's just good and dandy. And yeah. Uh, and so I think there were probably people, I mean, we're getting the stories where Jesus did heal, yeah. but there were, I'm sure there were some things that didn't happen right. that people wish that had would had would is that is that the proper would. english it doesn't matter <laughs> i'm i'm not i'm not that much of a snob okay that's good <laughs> um so but i think so for me yeah like uh the people who've helped me through my life difficulties yeah that's it's harder when you're a pastor it really is um and you'd like to think that your church could see you as a human being but if you're too transparent nobody will follow you either there has sure. to be some sense of and it, that's in anything in the sense, like if you're in a classroom, like if you are sitting under a teacher and then like you find out like this happened to us once we were at the Bible college and then find out like the teacher done cheated on his wife. It does not make class easy. Like mm -hmm. it, a class would have gone on better if we didn't know that. Sure. <laughs> right. Like, sure. so, so that's why it's hard for people that are in a, a leader of a group in some way, shape or form. Right. So that's why, my, you know, a lot of times in a presbytery, if you're a pastor listening to this, so this is the importance of meeting more than just presbytery. I mean, your pastors are technically your, your fellow church members uh, that can hold you up in prayer and you can be honest with, or you can, now, like I said, I had an elder in my church that was uh, super spiritual and good, and I, I felt comfortable with them. And uh, so anyway, that was one of the people who helped me out a lot. But the church yeah. in general, not getting into your personal life, delving too much, they know when your pastor's hurting. And so, you know, they, they do good things. Um, but so, like, one thing the church does do, I've always said it's, it's hard to go through rough times. And it's super hard to go through rough times if you think you're doing it alone. Sure. So, um, come here, man. Um, one of the things that the church does is provide a, a physical or a, you know, material promise that God is in your presence is still, is still with you. And I sure. think that's really important in sure. these, if you the, uh, the imagery of the redwoods, you know? Yes. Oh, I love that. The sequoias. Yeah, that was great. And I think that's a good way of looking at, there's a book called growing spiritual redwoods written 25 30 years ago that was pretty good about church development and formation that's good. awesome i think right here i hate to plug other stuff but just if in your sunday school class and um, just so you're aware there is something called the employee assistance program through the EA, eap um for pastors um to receive counseling so if you know your pastor is going through a hard time um you can seek out um is it pam yeah, that's over there. So Pam Phillips Burke, um, for pastoral develop, development ministry team, um, just 
just so you know that there is a resource and availability out there if your pastor is having a hard time, that you can get some assistance that way. But okay, go back to the sequoias. I love this imagery. I'm I'm all about imagery because that's that's how my mind works and that's how I see things. And this intertwining of the root systems for mutual support. This to me is a beautiful example of exactly what church family is supposed to be about. This is what we should be. We should be as brothers and sisters in Christ working together to lift up and encourage each other and hold each other up in those times where we have terrible circumstances in our life. Um, this is what church family should look like. And hopefully and prayerfully your church does look like that, that you're, you're just wrapping your arms around each other and holding each other up during, during difficult times. All right. You ready for applying the scripture? I am. All right. So, um, Kip uses a illustration from the film the silver linings playbook i'll let people yeah. go into that i've never seen it don't have a comment on it either. so i don't want to do that but i think again what i want to do is to um he ends this with the discussion of signs right what does signs mean and all that jazz and and people often ask me if i if i you know looks for signs when i'm trying to make decisions or, or these kinds of things so i just want to start with that discussion question and we'll we'll end it with that do you think God still uses signs? Do you remember a time when you were looking for a sign and got one? Describe the event. How did you know it was a sign? How can we know? Should all signs point us to God's love or uh, the people that God loves? What do you think? Mm. You recently yes. had to make a decision in life. How did you go I, about it? I did. Um, oh my goodness. So that's, that's a great story. And I don't want to get into all the nuances of it, but do I think that God still uses signs? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so was I looking for a sign? Sure. Yes. Um, this, this life transition was probably one of the most difficult decisions I've ever made in my life. Um, just because I was personally comfortable and very happy where I was at. Uh, but God made it very clear to me that this was the intention for my life. Um, so I prayed a lot. I mean, a lot, lot. Um, I can't even tell you how many times I was at the altar of, of the church, just asking for the right direction and making sure that I was making the right decisions. And, um, and it, it became very, very clear to me that this was the right decision and this was the direction that God had. So should all signs point to God's love or to the people that God loves? I, I don't, I don't know. That's a really good question because if you would ask me uh, for this particular transition in life, was it pointing specifically to God's love or to people that God in a roundabout way? Yes, but it was more about a transformation of my own heart and recognizing that I uh, promised God a long time ago that I would go wherever he asked me to go. Um, and, and he reminded me that he's asked me to go and I promised that I would. So I went. <laughs> yeah. So when I think of signs, it doesn't necessarily have to be like, should I wear this, you know, Lord, give me a sign. Should it be this tie or that tie? Yeah. Right. Or anything should like be that. The scarf today or the other yeah. scarf, you know, like, or I do remember when I was trying to make a choice on what seminary to go to. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I just remember I got to a point to where like I wanted signs I you know I'd read over Gideon and the different ones and like you know wet fleece dry fleece like whatever um, and then I, I kind of finally decided like in some sense the signs point to doing God's will or to knowing God more and so yes. I remember thinking to myself you know like if I go to like my choices here are going to seminary in one place or the other either way I go I'm glorifying God and I'm I'm seeking a deeper relationship with God. I'm seeking to serve God. I'll let God figure that out. Pick whatever you want to pick because sure. the sign wasn't necessary. I didn't understand signs specifically in specific actions, but the ultimate goal of what God wants me to realize or understand. And so while I sometimes have my little Calvinism, the other, you know, where I think everything's fatalism. And then at the other side, I think it's all up to me or everything's going to fall. Um, I did at least reach a point to where, like, in my mind, as long as I was following the sign, whatever sign went to Christ, if, if I could, sure. 
examine my motives, examine the things around me and say, this is leading me to a better understanding of Jesus, or if this is leading me to a deeper devotion to God or to service, then I'm okay with it. Because there's some things that are obviously not that, <laughs> right? There's some decisions you can make that are obvious, not yes. signs to God, right? Right. Like, um, and that would be in your relationships. Like I guarantee there is no, under no circumstance, under, I'm going to say this under no circumstance is God leading you to, you know, have a relationship with a married woman. There's no right. sign that points that way. Right. But you could, you know, I've Not. seen in counseling, I've seen where people can convince themselves that, oh, this is what God wants me to do for various and sundry reasons. And they're not bad people. It's just they've looked for signs and the, it, it didn't. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm, right? like, mm -hmm. um, That's a good point. So how, how can we know that it's a sign? It's it's never the sign will never be anything that points you to something contrary to scripture. Yeah, I think that's what Ever. Trip meant when he said, does it does a sign always point to God's love or the love of and yes, I think in generally speaking, like if it points you away from that, it's a sign, but not a good one. It's not but the not one from God. <laughs> not that is not a sign from God. <laughs> right. You know, so I think that's how I understand signs nowadays. It's not just a yes or no, I shouldn't do this or I shouldn't do that. It's more of am I getting in touch with the old, with, with the designer of the sign? Is it getting me closer sure. to the truth of this, you know, the person? And that's why yeah. I understand signs nowadays. Yeah. yeah, me too. Yeah. It's, it's always something that's going to glorify God and, and bring him honor church. And yes, you know. yes. Yeah. It's never something that's going to bring dishonor to yourself or, well, it might bring dishonor to yourself in a way like the prophets were dishonored by their by their fellow sure. Israelites a lot of times, right? But I guess you're probably right. It, it brings honor to God, even if nobody else can mm -hmm. see it, right? Mm -hmm. Or appreciate yes. it. Yep. Yeah. If you're a Sunday school Absolutely. teacher, I would say uh, you could you could talk about that a little bit because you know signs and wonders. We don't stop talking about them now. So, um, all right. Well, I'm going to end this thing today. Um, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Preach and teach well. Becky, you got any parting thoughts? Amen. Just have a beautiful and blessed week and, and look for some signs this week, maybe. Awesome. Have a good one. Bye.